Hello again, everyone. This is Dr. Reynolds from the American Institute for Cognitive Therapy, and we are going to be talking about tobacco and prescription drug use in this video. So again, jumping right in, we've got a wonderful chart here tracking data of prevalence of daily use of cigarettes by grade. So our top chart, 12th graders, you've got the yellow graph, 10th graders, and then the bottom one being 8th graders. Looking over time, starting back in 1970 to now, that looks like a really great trend. On the surface, smoking is going down. That's a great thing. However, there may be some other methods that people are ingesting and consuming nicotine that are increasing, so it's worth talking about that as well. All right. When we look at tobacco use, smoking in particular is the leading cause of preventable death. You're looking at thousands upon thousands of people that die because of smoking-related illnesses every year. As we just saw, that trend is hopefully going to be going down, but it's still a very alarming thing. Treatments are available for smoking cessation. Definitely look into these if you are trying to quit. Cigarette smoking is responsible for almost half a million deaths per year in the United States, including more than 41,000 deaths resulting from secondhand smoke exposure. So this is not even necessarily applicable to only those who smoke, but also people who might be around smokers. Parents, siblings, things like this. When I said before that while the trend looks good, it's not necessarily cause for celebration just yet. That's because of using e-cigarettes or vaping. Past month use of cigarettes, according to the National Institute of Drug Abuse, was about 3.6% among 8th graders, 6% among 10th graders, and about 11.5% among 12th graders. But if we look at e-cigarette use, Past month, 9.5% among 8th graders, 14% among 10th graders, and 16.2% among 12th graders. So this is where I add the caveat, you know, it looks like e-cigarette use and vaping is on the rise. Maybe it's not that people are smoking cigarettes, but that they're vaping as an alternative. And to be honest, folks, at best, the jury is still out as to whether or not this is an appropriate replacement. And the more evidence we get, it's looking more and more like it's not a... Uh, it's not an effective alternative to smoking because of its own problems. So let's talk about vaping in particular. There seems to be, at least uh, on the market, some difference between e-cigs, vape pens, and personalizable, personal vaporizers. Uh, this may be very dated information within a few months, uh, maybe dated information now, but it's really kind of on the cutting edge with a lot of this stuff. So, e-cigs, I think, are things that are marketed. Uh, popular brands include Logic. Uh, you've got vape pens, which are more uh, additions as ways of heating up we're calling the e-juice or e-liquid, and then you have personalized vaporizers that can sometimes be up into the hundreds of dollars per unit. Essentially, the way that these devices work is that there's a battery that heats up the e-liquid, which is converted to an aerosol and then inhaled. It is a common misconception that this is simply water vapor. Water vapor has no suspended solids, and by the very nature of you taking this juice, heating it up, and inhaling it, you're getting some particles in the quote-unquote vapor, it's not really vapor, therefore it's not a vapor, it's an aerosol, it's got these suspended particles. That's where some of the issues come about vaping, is that the content of what's actually being inhaled can include things like heavy metals. What we're finding now is that some of the heating coils associated with these products, the, the actual part of it that heats up the juice and vaporizes it and turns it into that suspension, they, they break down a little bit. And so in a way, people are starting to inhale things like chromium, nickel, and other heavy metals, lead, that are in these devices as they break down and heat up. So it's not necessarily uh, a safe alternative as we're finding out. Now if we look at popular e-cig brands, they can vary pretty dramatically in their strength and uh, unfortunately a lot of times the marketing aspect, what's popular among young people, tends to skew towards the higher nicotine concentrations. If you look at a popular brand like Logic, they cap their nicotine content at 27 milligrams per milliliter whereas a company like Juul makes products that are about double that or more. 
55 and 60 mill milligrams per milliliter of nicotine content. So the way it's described on the Juul marketing website is that this is a product that is designed to be an alternative for heavy smokers. And I think, well, unfortunately, what's actually happening is that people are using this as their baseline level of use. Another critique of the Juul in particular is that the shape of the actual device looks a bit like a flash drive, so it can be kind of unobtrusive, and there's an argument that this is a way that children, teens, young people are hiding that they might be smoking these e-cigarettes or, or vaporizers. Um, as a matter of fact, the phrase jeweling has become increasingly popular. They've basically taken the brand name of Jewel and made it into a verb, so now you are jeweling. Uh, again, from the company standpoint, Juul would say, well, we want to market this as a product that doesn't look or feel like a cigarette as a way of creating an alternative to help people quit, but the net effect might be that people are using this as a way of hiding the fact that they're using these aerosol e-cigs. Shifting to prescription medications, uh, just some interesting background. We're going to talk about prescription medications in terms of opioids, but also... Um, anti-anxiety medications, stimulant medications that are designed for ADHD but may be uh, also being abused in some instances. So just as an introduction, um, heroin is actually a brand name. Heroin was made by Bayer in 1895. The drug compound is diacetylmorphine. They synthesized that into heroin and marketed it as pain relief. Um, now we know that heroin is very, very potent and very problematic, along with many other opioid drugs. It's estimated that about 2.1 million Americans have substance use disorder due to opioid pain reliever use, and about a half a million met criteria because of heroin use. If we look at unintentional overdoses, they have increased 400% since 1999, and that's the Substance Use and Mental Health Alliance. Drug overdose is the leading cause of accidental death in the United States with over 50,000 lethal drug overdoses in 2015. Opioid use contributed to 20,000 overdose deaths related to those pain relievers and about 13,000 overdose deaths were related to heroin in 2015, American Society for Addiction Medicine. Looking at the opiates in particular, just the prescription rates, this chart is showing the rate that prescription drugs have been prescribed and you see the dramatic increases from 1991 to 2013 a steady rise and luckily in 2012 2013 it's kind of seeming to drop from its peak at 2011 but the rates with, with these medications have been prescribed has doubled and it's very very problematic we are finding that while they can be prescribed by doctors, that does not necessarily mean that they are inherently safe. These can be incredibly problematic in their own right. Shifting now to other prescription medications, things like Xanax, Valium, and other anxiolytics, anxiolytics being the class of drugs that are anti-anxiety medications. If you look at Xanax in particular, uh, there's a small diagram in the, the bottom right hand screen that shows a Xanax pill and people will colloquially refer to these as bars. If you look at the bar shape, that's a two milligram pill of Xanax. And oftentimes people who are abusing Xanax will refer to the number of Xanax bars they have taken. So people are taking multiples of these where sometimes a dose could be as small as one fourth of one of these bars. Uh, Alprazolam, that is the uh, generic name for Xanax. It has a shorter half-life, which means it's uh, more quickly absorbed and metabolized in the body, so that might lead to more withdrawal symptoms than something like Valium. Valium tends to have a longer half-life, so it stays in your system a little bit longer. Uh, similarly, Alprazolam, Xanax withdrawal, might be more severe after shorter periods of use. Now, one major issue that comes up often when we talk about Xanax, Valium, and other anxiolytics is the number of ER visits associated with the use. Because these drugs work to sort of slow things down, if you think about their anti-anxiety, anxiety speeds you up, the medications that are anti-anxiety slow you down. If people are taking these not as an anti-anxiety medication, but using it recreationally or for abuse, 
Oftentimes they combine this with other drugs, especially things like alcohol, and what you see is a synergistic effect. People who are taking Xanax or Valium along with alcohol, you're getting almost double duty. So alcohol has a tendency to slow you down. It's a central nervous system depression. While these are also CNS depressants, and you can sometimes get the synergistic effect where you're actually starting to impact things like respiration and heart rate. Your brain is slowing down so much to the point that people can then die from it. Uh, the number of ER visits, accordingly, has more than doubled. In 2005, the number of patient cases involving Xanax was about 57,000, and by 2011, uh, the last year for which the CNN article that this came from had data, there were 123,744 ER visits associated with Xanax use. So this is also becoming an increasing problem in today's society. Looking at peak effects, uh, a lot of times people are abusing Valium, Xanax. Xanax tends to have a shorter half-life, so uh, sometimes people are abusing that because it's out of your system quicker. And now we have Adderall, Ritalin, and other psychostimulants. These are medications that are designed and prescribed for ADHD use, but we're finding that really they are uh, almost like speed, in essence. They kind of speed up brain functioning even among normal people that don't have a diagnosis. So while somebody with ADHD may need these medications to help them with their focus, it essentially acts by speeding up the part of the brain that slows us down, if that makes sense. People that don't have ADHD are taking these same drugs and just getting a boost almost from it. And so again, much like with alcohol, this is a real problem potentially on college campuses. People who are abusing Adderall or other psychostimulants as a way of studying or cramming for finals. That is not to say that these medications are necessarily safe. Uh, oftentimes the active ingredient of things like amphetamines and methamphetamines, it's not simply just a study aid. There are real risks associated with using these drugs. Um, Unfortunately, a recent large study of college students found that about 29% of students felt that non-medical use would help people get better grades, so there's sometimes a positive outlook on these drugs. Full-time college students were twice as likely to have used Adderall non-medically than their counterparts who were not full-time students, so it is really geared towards, oh, take this, it'll help you study, but there are some real problems associated with these drugs as well. Uh, you have a popular band, Dexy and the Midnight Runners. Uh, the name was taken from the pill Dexedrine, which was another version of essentially speed. And uh, very recently, as of the taping of this, uh, there was a documentary on Netflix released called Take Your Pills. And one of the statistics from this documentary that stuck out for me was uh, in 1990, about 600,000 children were on stimulants to treat ADHD, but by 2011, that number had risen to 3.5 million American children. So again, I think it is absolutely the case that children with ADHD can benefit and uh, you know have some real positive effects from these medications, but using them for children who don't have ADHD or abusing these drugs can have some serious implications and it's worth having a discussion about what impact this has on people and how are we using these things that have a very big impact on our bodies. And that is all we have for uh, drugs of abuse in terms of the prescription medications and tobacco. Next we'll be talking about cocaine use, other stimulant use, and some over-the-counter drugs that are often sold in smoke shops and other areas like that. So, thanks so much.